The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Lunch and Learn. It is Friday, the 24th of January. Today, we have guest speaker, Dr. Corey, uh, Corey Hammond. Corey's going to be talking about integrating clinical hypnosis and neurofeedback together. Um, I'm not going to do a whole lot of um, uh, intro on Corey. He can give you some background. He's going to go over some history. But he was uh, previously president at ISNR and the American Society for Clinical Hypnosis. He's written numerous papers. Um, he will have uh, this PowerPoint ready for us, so which I'll send out after his presentation is done. So without any further uh, of my babbling on, Corey, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. The show is yours. All right. It's good to be with you. Uh, initially, I'm going to talk about what hypnosis is, a few of the myths about it, then talk about um, areas where research has documented that hypnosis is highly effective. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, Penniston and Kolkowski's uh, work. Uh, basically, it was hypnotically facilitated neurofeedback. And I'm going to talk about my own personal decision tree of when I choose to use hypnosis first versus neurofeedback first and integrating the two. And I'm going to talk about general suggestion effects and placebo effects and how we can maximize uh, some of that. So to begin with, let's see if I can uh, get the slides to, there we go. Let's just define hypnosis. I think a very simple way of, of talking about it is that it is a uh, focused state of concentration where we really concentrate the patient's attention and then offer suggestions. Um, hypnotic responsiveness also is associated with EEG patterns. Research has shown that people who are highly responsive to hypnosis, both as they're going into hypnosis and as um, they're just sitting in a resting state, have more high theta around 5.5 to 7.5 hertz and more 40 hertz activity. And different suggestions will produce different kinds of changes in the brain. There's just not one single um, kind of part of the brain that is involved. It depends on what you're suggesting. Hypnotic responsiveness is very high in children, up to about the ages of 13 to 14. And fascinatingly, at that age is when the uh, background rhythm shifts from theta into alpha. And so if you're working with children, especially below the age of 13, uh, it's important to learn how to use hypnosis informally. Um, because you can do a tremendous amount of work. Um, with children, uh, you can do eyes open kinds of informal techniques. You don't have to do a traditional kind of hypnotic induction. And uh, it can be very, very powerful. We'll talk more about this. There's a concept of what I call the naturalistic or everyday trance. We all experience this kind of state. We just don't call it uh, hypnosis. Like when you're driving down the road deep in thought and you snap out of it and realize you haven't seen anything for the last three or four blocks or when you're totally absorbed in a movie and so i always tell patients you've already experienced states like hypnosis many times also people in emergency situations coming into an emergency room or where an emt is encountering them after an accident those situations, attention is very, very riveted already. And what we've learned is you can just start giving hypnotic kinds of suggestions and have that be enormously effective in terms of reducing pain, reducing blood flow and blood loss. And, um, you know, in those situations, you can just say, you know, just close your eyes and I want you to imagine this and just start uh, working. So what are some of the phenomenon traditionally associated with hypnosis? I'll go over this very quickly, just some of them. Catalepsy is an involuntary tonicity of muscles. So that if you lift an arm, for example, and you can leave it positioned in front of their face uh, with it just kind of remaining there with an inhibition of fatigue. Most people think of amnesia. Uh, you can 
suggest amnesia, and sometimes spontaneous amnesia will happen in a very deep hypnotic state. However, uh, I rarely ever suggest amnesia. There really isn't a, a need to do that, and the duration of amnesia is, is unpredictable. Dissociation is simply feeling detached from the immediate environment and is something particularly used with pain relief. Analgesia and anesthesia, like turning down the dimmer switch on a light. Estimates are that from 70 to 90% of people can experience at least some degree of analgesia. Perhaps 10 to 20% can develop complete anesthesia. There's some wonderful research that's been done, uh, some of which would never pass IRB uh, requirements today, which uh, has documented how hypnotic analgesia reduces inflammation and promotes uh, more healing. And I'll often produce what we call glove anesthesia, uh, a numbness in the hand, uh, to be able to poke it with a pin and let the person see the real difference between that and their other hand as a convincer to them of the power of their own mind to influence their body. And I have taken patients through surgeries, one of them four hours long, where hypnosis was the sole anesthesia, and they were blocking the pain with their own mind. Idiomotor activity, um, we can set up what are called idiomotor signals, for example, where one finger is a signal for yes, another one for no, another one for I don't want to answer, another one for I don't know, where they have the experience of this floating up involuntarily all by itself. It's one of the easier phenomenon to, uh, to facilitate. And with this, you can also do some rapid unconscious exploration. For example, with pain, about any unconscious uh, factors and elements um, that may be associated with their chronic pain problem. Time distortion, I'll let you read that for a moment while I get a sip of water. It's a very useful kind of phenomenon in sports with, with pain, a number of things like that. And we all experience that naturalistically as well. Age regression. You can take someone back and sometimes it'll feel as if they're really four years old again. Um, more often you get what's called a partial regression where part of them clearly is feeling like that child and part of them has their adult perspective. There are a lot of myths about hypnosis and memory and I'll talk about that in a few moments, but this can be very effective. Uh, I've used this in investigations with uh, the FBI, police, um, things like that. Age progression, where they're imagining themselves in the future and how life is going to be after they're over this problem, which is a little bit like um, a mental rehearsal that some people will, will simply use in cognitive therapy. But in a hypnotic state, it can be even more powerful. Now, why is hypnosis facilitated? First of all, I think it allows us to really fully focus the patient's attention. It enhances positive expectancies about treatment outcome. It facilitates a more rapid re uh, evolution of a therapeutic relationship. And self-hypnosis gives your patients or clients greater um, sense of involvement and something they can use for self-mastery. Like a, a man I'm seeing right now with tremendous anxiety Part of that is public speaking anxiety, and he has to do presentations and meetings. And uh, in addition to neurofeedback, I've also got him practicing self-hypnosis. There's also what we refer to as an active alert uh, hypnosis or an informal hypnosis. Research has shown since uh, Hilgard's work at Stanford back in the 1970s that you can, for example, put someone on an exercise bike have them actively pedaling away and do a hypnotic induction with them and produce all the various phenomena of hypnosis. So you don't have to have somebody in a relaxed state doing hypnosis, although most commonly uh, we will. But 
just giving someone suggestions, uh, particularly when you kind of informally focus their attention, can also be very powerful. There are a lot of myths about hypnosis that I'll educate patients about before I ever do hypnosis, um, because negative attitudes will su suppress their ability to respond. Interestingly, research has shown that when you simply label what you're doing as hypnosis, it increases the efficacy of it. So I encourage people uh, who are doing uh, some of this kind of work not to refer to it as mental imagery or uh, just relaxation, because uh, simply labeling it hypnosis uh, creates positive expectancies and increases the efficacy. I always emphasize to people I'm teaching hypnosis to professionals that we're not hypnotists, we're just adding one more therapeutic tool. One of the things I'll educate patients about is you don't lose control. You know, they'll say, well, what about those people that get up on stage and act goofy? I'll say, well, the lay uh, or the uh, stage hypnotist will kind of screen the audience, first of all, get everyone involved in doing a couple of simple little things where they can look and see people who look like they're more highly responsive and particularly encourage those folks to get up. Um, and they'll always have others that are just anxious to get up there on stage. So then they'll go through a few things, basically screening for who is very responsive to hypnosis and also willing to act silly and just go along. So out of 15 people they may have on stage initially, pretty soon that may be uh, down to eight people that then they go ahead and, and work with. But we don't really believe you can be forced to do something against your will. Again, hypnosis simply represents a focused state of attention. I often use the metaphor of me as a kid playing with a magnifying glass and focusing the rays of the sun down. When you work with people, it's as though some people can only focus the rays of the sun down to uh, a silver dollar size, and it's not going to do too much for them. Uh, others down to the size of a, a dime. Others right down to pinhead size, and it's startling what those people can do. And the only way to really honestly know is just work with somebody and do a hypnotic induction. We emphasize that basically all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. I want patients to know this is not a, a mental tug of war here. This is something that I'm just helping you facilitate and you're going along if you want, but no one can, can force you to do this. It's a cooperative endeavor, not a tug of war. I'll also tell them that, you know, many people expect to have amnesia. Um, I'm not going to suggest amnesia to you. I expect that you'll remember everything that happened. And uh, that doesn't mean that you're, you're not in a hypnotic state. Now, the myth about hypnosis contaminating memory. I actually have a book with two colleagues called Memory, Trauma Treatment, and the Law. It won the Guttmacher Award for Best Publication of the Year in Psychiatry and the Law from American Psychiatric Association and the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law. And I have an entire chapter in that book reviewing all of the research on hypnosis and memory. The research shows Hypnosis does not contaminate memory. That it is the interview method and the people can be led and their memory contaminated as easily out of hypnosis or in hypnosis, depending on an unduly suggestive approach. And thus when we do this forensically, uh, if some of you are interested, I can send you a paper that a colleague of mine, Bill Wester, and I published on cases where this has been used with uh, the uh, drug enforcement agencies, with the FBI. Uh, we always videotape everything so that it can be documented, what they remembered before hypnosis and uh, non-suggestive uh, influences uh, were, were there. And I mentioned the concept of the everyday trance. Now, I just emphasize there's two overall ways in my way of thinking 
of, of using hypnosis. One is suggestive hypnosis, where somebody's coming in, let's say, and they're wanting to stop smoking, or they're wanting help with their pain problem, or to control anxiety, where I'm simply giving them positive suggestions, teaching them how to use imagery and give themselves suggestions and get into a hypnotic state. And with most of these people, I will record something for them, like um, have them uh, set their phone up on record and record uh, a 10, 15, 20 minute uh, session where uh, they can use this for reinforcement. And sometimes, with what we call ego strengthening suggestions to increase confidence. Um, I have a whole chapter on those kinds of suggestions. There's a book, if any of you are really interested in hypnosis, called Handbook of Hypnotic Suggestions and Metaphors. It's 600 pages. I donated the royalties to the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis and basically, uh, tells you, all right, once you've got somebody in a relaxed, focused state, what are some of the kinds of suggestions that you can give to people? Then there's what I refer to as insight-oriented hypnosis. If you've got a more complex kind of problem, or when you've done suggestive hypnosis for two or three or four sessions and the person is not seeming to, to advance, then you can punt and uh, look are there any unconscious uh, purposes, motivations, uh, unresolved things that, uh, that we can identify? And that's one of the advantages with hypnosis. If you're going to have an inside-oriented phase of treatment, you, know, you can often rapidly speed that up. Now, one of the things I emphasize um, th that you do is involving the patient with mental imagery. Uh, it can be exceptionally powerful, whether somebody is in a, a formal hypnotic state or not. Um, we emphasize that rather than using willpower, we use the power of imagination. So I'll give you some examples. Um, when I was presenting at uh, ISNR, uh, I asked people who had some level of pain to raise their hands, and I would guess um, 30, 35% of the audience raised their hands. I had them identify where that pain was. Was it a, a knee, their back? I asked them to simply close their eyes and imagine what that area of their body looked like. To imagine the color, the texture, if it was painful maybe, they were imagining it looking like a, a towel that was twisted and knotted. And once they had that image in their mind, and I said, I want you to imagine that you have a dial in your hand, that you're not going to abruptly turn, but you're going to very gradually turn it. And I want you to gradually transform this image into a very comfortable looking image, changing the texture, the color, the size and shape, even the sound of this to a more comfortable, very comfortable image. And I gave them a minute or so to do that and then asked them to just hold that image in their mind for another minute or so. When I've done this innumerable times in uh, university courses or workshops, um, lots of people will say my pain level was uh, a seven, now it's a three, or it was a, a six, now it's a two, um, where we really hadn't done any kind of formal induction. You can do this with acid stomach, there's research showing. Just imagining something like I've just described decreases uh, gastric secretions. We use it with pain, with sports performance. I was asked by a, a coach of a U.S. ski team downhill racer to work with him. I told him I haven't done much skiing. Uh, they said that's all right and uh, with the help of the coach and uh, the patient uh, I, I got a good idea of, of what he needed to experience. This is a guy who was coming in uh, you know fourth, fifth, sixth in, in World Cup races. He'd had a bad spill now he was coming in 25th 
I had about three sessions with him, recorded something for him, where he was imagining a perfect downhill run. And um, after about three weeks, he went back to France for the last World Cup race of the season and finished in first place by a full two seconds. So I will tell the patient, actively use your imagination and uh, you can incorporate this in whatever you're doing. So again, we refer to some of this as the law of reversed effect, that the harder we consciously try to do something like help ourselves to go to sleep, the more difficult it is to succeed. That imagination will always win out over willpower, especially in facilitating physiological effects. And um, I could cite some more cases, but now this is an interesting uh, PowerPoint that I made up a long time ago uh, of a study that was done with a meta-analysis of different methods of controlling and working with pain. Relaxation had a 0.67 effect. The effect size with cognitive therapy, 0.7. Six, I think that is, Rel uh, relaxation 0.67. Biofeedback, which was EMG biofeedback, 0.95. A multi-component treatment package of many of these kinds of things, 1.33. And when you looked at hypnosis or autogenic training, the effect size was 2.7. Uh, I clearly believe that hypnosis is the most effective non-medication, non-surgical treatment for pain. And I can't cite all of the research for you. Uh, there's not enough time, but patients high in hypnotic responsiveness have been found in controlled research to get analgesic relief that can actually be more effective than a shot of morphine. There have been studies uh, using hypnosis to reduce pain, anxiety, needs for medication, and in increasing stability uh, with radiological intervention procedures, hand surgery, dental surgery, and in children with, with uh, bone marrow transplants, all of them documenting its effectiveness and its superiority to cognitive behavior treatment. Hypnotic preparation for surgery not just using it in surgery, but with someone who's going to be having surgery. And in many cases, I'll make a, a recording for them to listen to at home. It's been documented that when you do this, it reduces the pain, uh, the pain level after surgery, blood loss, helps control nausea and vomiting, and reduces inflammation and facilitates um, better healing. When the cost effectiveness of hypnosis with patients undergoing interventional radiological procedures was studied, it was found that when hypnosis was used along with chemical sedation, there was a more than 50% cost savings for the patient. Hypnosis can uh, influence vascular control. Uh, in surgery, uh, you often see blood loss. Uh, less blood loss by about 65%. You can use it with hemophilia patients who have uh, trouble you know, going to the dentist for fear they're gonna have to have a blood transfusion. Headaches and migraines, I published a review paper a number of years ago. It is startling how effective it is, more effective than any medication treatment with both headaches and migraines. With cancer patients, it uh, reduces nausea, vomiting, and is useful in pain relief. Irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, I published a review, there have been more recent reviews of this published, where controlled research shows in follow-up studies that 82 to 95% of hypnotically treated IBS patients show significant improvement and also encouraging results with ulcerative colitis and other GI problems. With ulcers, it was a wonderful study that was done carefully controlled with a one-year follow-up. They found that 100% of patients who received 
just medication treatments for duodenal ulcers um, that were documented to have healed by scoping them one year later had their ulcers back compared to 53% of those who've been taught self-hypnosis. It's very, very useful with anxiety, with PTSD, with depression. A hypnotic cognitive therapy has been found to produce uh, significantly greater improvements in depression and anxiety than CBT alone. Obstetrics and gynecology. I've uh, used it uh, to teach women how to uh, do childbirth uh, with hypnosis as the anesthesia. In other cases, they've been able to significantly reduce um, the pain. And you can reduce hyperemesis gravidarum, which is a nausea and vomiting associated with, uh, especially the first three months of pregnancy. So lots of research on dermatologic and, and uh, allergic conditions. If you're interested in getting some formal hypnosis training, my strongest recommendation would be the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. Um, they will uh, be meeting at the annual meeting in uh, March in Reno. I'll be one of the people teaching there. But also every uh, two or three months, they have uh, a workshop starting on Thursday evening, going until noon on Sunday, both uh, with beginning, intermediate, and advanced levels uh, that are, are running and where you get uh, a chance to uh, practice uh, under some supervision. A significant amount of responsiveness to suggestion that we see when someone is hypnotized can also occur in response to what's been called waking suggestions. And again, especially with children between the ages of five and, and 12, they are highly, highly responsive to hypnosis. There's some great books, uh, Dan Cohen and uh, Karen Olness, uh, the names are reversed there. Um, they have uh, a textbook that's in about its fourth edition. It's wonderful with children. Suggestion and placebo effects, I would emphasize, are associated with every form of treatment. And I, I absolutely believe it's, it's associated with neurofeedback as well. Wise clinicians seek to maximize anything that's going to help the patient improve. We don't have to control placebo influences or suggestive influences in clinical work. Expectancy and the power of suggestion are an important component in obtaining placebo improvements. And in fact, expectancy effects appear to result in activation of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens and reward circuitry of the brain. Thus, for example, Acupuncture has been verified to have both specific and also placebo effects. In order to add the benefits of suggestion to your work, um, be aware of some of the variables that increase placebo effects. These are simple things like our showing interest in and concern for the patient, making frequent eye contact, showing empathic understanding, displaying confidence and appearing competent and trustworthy through our knowledge of the literature, our certifications and degrees that are displayed and so on. In acupuncture, individuals with higher expectations that acupuncture would help had larger clinical improvements, whether real or sham acupuncture was used. This was not only verified in eight weeks of treatment, but also in a six month follow-up Research has shown the mind-body interaction that takes place in pain from placebo is in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate and midbrain, while real acupuncture shows an effect in the insula. The power of suggestion has been documented in many studies. Irving Kirsch has done some of the, the finest research. He and Wexel in 1988 compared response to caffeinated or decaffeinated coffee uh, in a double blind study. At 20 minutes after administration, the group receiving decaf coffee who believed it contained caffeine showed significantly higher systolic blood pressure. 
physiological arousal created by expectancy. So a person's beliefs about a medication that they're receiving is um, very influential and uh, produces even the same side effects <laughs> as the medication did. There are a couple of studies that showed that when it was simply suggested, quote, the agent you've been given is known to significantly reduce pain in some patients. Merely this suggestion was sufficient to increase placebo analgesia to a level equal to a topical analgesic. Words are very powerful. 90% of patients who have a higher pretreatment expectation that an antidepressant will be effective respond to treatment compared to only a third of those with the expectation that medication will be somewhat effective. It's very interesting that placebos that are identified as being tranquilizers produce very different effects than identical placebos that are identified as being stimulants. In a study of uh, angina, a high response rate ranging from 70 to 90% was found when an enthusiastic doctor was administering the placebo medication in comparison to a lower response of 30 to 40% when it was administered by a skeptical physician. So consider the difference between a researcher researching neurofeedback with a scientific detachment whose language implies uncertainty, like, let's try this and see if it does something, versus a clinician who seems enthusiastic and says, you know, research finds that 80% of people obtain significant improvements with this. And I anticipate that within four to six sessions, you'll begin noticing improvements. Compare the difference. Research on expectancy has shown that subtle differences in our words can result in considerably different outcomes. Really in hypnosis, what we're seeking to do is capture the patient's attention and then communicate ideas in a sophisticated way. In hypnosis, we learn to notice the implications of every word that we say. And it's important to realize that patient personality characteristics do not predict suggestibility. <laughs> It appears that most patients have the capacity to have a placebo response. But we need to foster positive expectations. This can be done by citing neurofeedback research, the results of long-term follow-ups, and citing our own clinical experience. However, creating positive expectancies must also be fostered in an ethical manner. And so I think informed consent and ethical behavior also require that we temper enthusiasm with accurate portrayals of the improvement rates that have been found in research, mentioning that there is a potential for side effects, uh, usually mild, uh, that can be readily changed when we adjust the protocol, and um, areas where the use of neurofeedback remains more experimental because we don't have good controlled research yet. The expectations fostered must be realistic um, because unrealistic expectations, for example, about the timetable for them experiencing change, can backfire as changes usually occur more gradually. It's better, I think, that the patient should anticipate that the change will be gradual. Irving first recommended an important part of any effective treatment is the inclusion of some means by which therapeutic change will be apparent to the client. It doesn't matter whether the initial change is due to the treatment itself, to expectancies generated by the treatment, or simply to random fluctuations. The important thing is that it be noticed by the client and interpreted as a sign of improvement. Feedback, especially experiential feedback, strengthens the effects of positive expectations, he said. Thus, for example, I speculate that if a neurofeedback intervention like alpha-theta training, done with eyes closed while engaging in mental imagery, results in increased feelings of calm and relaxation, this will increase the positive expectations the patient has about um, the eventual outcomes of treatment. 
Such feedback can also come from showing the patient trend graphs, statistics, showing them changes in their raw EEG that's occurred over a course of a number of sessions or a session. And when a mild side effect occurs, like feeling fatigued or overstimulated after a session, it may actually enhance positive expectancies, uh, just as has been noted with medication side effects. So let's talk about Peniston and Kolkowski's work. This is some of the work that basically got me inter interested in the end of the field. We should really think of their work as being hypnotically facilitated neurofeedback. Their work with alcoholics and PTSD was in reality a combination of neurofeedback combined with hypnosis. They started with six pre-training sessions where thermal biofeedback was combined with rhythmic breathing and autogenic training, which is simply a German structured form of self-hypnosis. Well, after teaching them this relaxation, then they had a session of visualization training where they would imagine alpha increasing, seeing what alpha waves look like on a chart and, and imagining them increasing. What well, in hypnosis we would call age progression, imagine themselves rejecting alcohol or drug offers, imagine themselves being sober, in different situations, imagining that they're confident, socially at ease, mellow, relaxed. Then there were 30 alpha theta sessions using visualizations as they drifted down, imagining these, these things I just mentioned, alpha increasing, them being successful, happy, abstinent. And then they would have abreactive experiences where they would work through those kinds of things. So I would just emphasize that um, their work is really a combination of the two. So let's give some examples of how I will many times informally integrate suggestions with the neurofeedback without any formal hypnosis at all. I actually have a, a handout that I gave out, a two-sided handout at uh, ISNR, which I will follow, uh, follow up by sending to Rob, and he can uh, provide that to all of you and post, post that. At the conclusion of a neurofeedback session or during a session, I might say, what do you notice right now? The implication is that there's something to be noticed. Do you feel different from when you walked in today? What's the implication? You may already. Are you beginning to notice some changes yet? Again, notice the implication of yet. In class, you'll be able to focus like this. Using this, for example, with a, a, a child with a ADD. And as they're really focusing in on the screen and producing changes and getting the, the reinforcements, uh, adding something like this. You know, as you study, you'll find yourself concentrating much more easily. It'll be easier to remember what you've learned. As you're studying, things that used to distract you won't bother you as much. When you study, other things going on around you will seem temporarily more distant and unimportant. When you begin to read, your mind will focus like this. When you read, it'll be as if your eyes are glued to the page. You'll concentrate intensely on the words you're reading, just like you're concentrating right now. And you see how you can use this informally, and probably many of you listening are already doing this. In a moment as you begin reading, it'll be as if your eyes are glued to the words reading rapidly without your eyes looking away from the words. Your unconscious mind is memorizing how this peacefulness feels. This peacefulness you're feeling is calming and reconditioning your central nervous system. Now, let me just talk about when I 
tend to use um, each of these interventions and when I tend to integrate them. This is just my personal decision tree. First of all, let me comment on what I call my law of parsimony. I think it's applicable in applying, uh, in using hypnosis or in using neurofeedback. The idea for me is you use the least complex intervention to get the job done. So with hypnosis, I may begin by using a suggestive hypnotic approach for one, two, three sessions. If they seem very responsive to hypnosis, but change isn't occurring, then I'll probably shift to more insight-oriented explorative hypnosis. Similarly with neurofeedback, I, I believe and, and recommend initially using the least complex neurofeedback approach. Some of you are probably aware of a paper that uh, I produced with Rob Coben and Martine Arns um, a year ago, where we, for example, looked at what the research actually showed on using Loretta neurofeedback or 19 uh, channel full cap training. And our review of that research showed there were really only two studies that were controlled, both of them small, one of them with normals, one of them with um, ADD. Other than that, everything published simply consisted of cases or a, a series of cases that were uncontrolled. And so we emphasized in that paper that all the people who are saying that um, doing 19 channel training or Loretta training is the most scientific a way to do neurofeedback, that it's more effective, that it um, cuts the training time in half, is completely unsupported and unscientific to even say. So uh, personally, I recommend using more traditional neurofeedback for which we have dozens of controlled research uh, uh, articles. And if you're doing one and two channel training, um, uh, sequential montage training, or, or maybe uh, four channel Z-score training, if that isn't yielding positive effects, then punt and you know, look at doing something more complex. I think it's important in choosing between neurofeedback and hypnosis to consider the preference and expectations of patients. Initial patient predispositions or expectations for which treatment approach they believe will be most successful have been shown to be related to lower dropout rates and especially in the early part of treatment. Once you have a therapeutic alliance established, initial expectations will become less important. Good old Arnold Lazarus, clear back in the early 70s, said, it's usually bad therapeutic practice to argue and try and sell one's own therapeutic system in place of that which the patient believes can best help. So I think a treatment approach that has credibility to the patient is congruent with their perception of what will help is a good place to start. Matching their expectations and preferences is very congruent with Milton Erickson's utilization philosophy. Therefore, with hypnosis, if a patient tells me they strongly believe there are unconscious factors that cause their problems, then I may start with an insight-oriented hypnotic approach. You know, if people are more rational, scientific-minded, the idea of neurofeedback and brain mapping is appealing, we'll certainly start with that. Later, I might add in something else like uh, hypnosis and combine it. I think um, another time-honored alternative to meeting patient expectations is to determine how effective it may be to structure and modify initial expectations when they're not firmly held. So let me, let me give you an example. I might say, um, okay, you believe that such and such will be more effective. Um, you, you may well be right. And um, so uh, why don't we start by doing that? However, I think this other uh, approach to treatment may also be really effective. So let's start with what, what you think will 
will be effective because I think we're often the world's authority on ourselves. But if that isn't producing change, then we may want to switch and try this other approach. How does that sound to you? I think this uh, approach is also appropriate given research that suggests that allowing patients the freedom of choice in selecting a treatment uh, will enhance positive outcomes. All right, so where do I use hypnosis first? If somebody's coming to me with a pain problem, headaches or migraines, I'm gonna go for hypnosis first and teaching them self-hypnosis. Same with anxiety and insomnia that are not too severe or chronic, or you know, test or, or phobic kinds of anxiety problems. Irritable bowel syndrome, it is so effective with that. <clears throat> if I can have half a dozen sessions with patients and get them practicing self-hypnosis every day, they're not gonna need more. Cancer patients, preparing people for surgery, hemophiliacs, enuresis, uh, bed wetting, habit disorders, all these things are where I'm going to start with hypnosis first. On the other hand, I'll use neurofeedback as the first intervention with ADD, ADHD, or learning disabilities, with concussions, head injuries, and stroke, alcoholism and substance abuse, uncontrolled epilepsy, obsessive compulsive disorder. Research shows overall people with obsessive compulsive disorder have lower hypnotic responsiveness. With chronic depression, anxiety, and insomnia, I'll, I'll go for neurofeedback first. Cognitive decline with aging, neurofeedback. Autism spectrum disorders, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue, and also cognitive slowing associated with chemotherapy and radiation. But I will also commonly, with these conditions, use a combination of the two, a fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, peak performance training, depression where there's self-esteem and confidence issues, again, using suggestions, like I mentioned that handbook of hypnotic suggestions and metaphors, an entire chapter in there has what we call ego strengthening suggestions. Um, that I, I compiled and, and elicited from over 100 uh, top clinicians around the, the world. Epilepsy, self-calming can help reduce seizures. Also giving them suggestions as part of that for having adequate sleep and, and diet and so on. With panic attacks, anxiety, self-hypnosis can teach them self-calming skills. Eating disorders, Abuse and PTSD. In our book uh, called Memory Trauma Treatment and the Law, we have an entire chapter on phase-oriented trauma treatment, starting not with memory work, but with um, stabilization of their symptoms first. And if you're going to enhance immune function, I think neurofeedback can help with that, but um, hypnosis can as well. By the way, Brain Master has a new workshop on, uh, on hypnosis that they have. So um, I think we have some time for questions. I know I've been moving rapidly, but I've tried to, to do that so we'd have at least five minutes for questions if, if anyone has them. Okay, Corey, uh, Richard will begin to unmute people, so it'll take a minute or so. Okay. Um, but one of the people wrote, uh about you know do you use alpha theta and where would that fit in with um, hypnosis versus standard neurofeedback or other interventions um so can everybody still hear me right now oh yes they can hear you absolutely okay. well um i think alpha theta training is hypnotically facilitated neurofeedback so, ah, there we I, go when I'm doing alpha theta training, um, <clears throat> I'm certainly, especially as they're drifting down into it early in the process, I'm using hypnotic kinds of things. I may even do uh, a little bit of hypnotic, traditional hypnotic induction things as they're drifting down into it. But I will also be emphasizing to them uh, using imagery in the ways we've talked about. It. Okay, well, since we're getting people unmuted, so I'm gonna let other people ask questions.
Anybody yeah. out there? I, I think any of you who are interested in the formal hypnotic training, um, <clears throat> go to ASCH.net, the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. They have fine training, training workshops. If any of you are near Reno, we're going to be there shortly. Yes. Um, if somebody comes in for neurofeedback and they ask, oh, what, where's the research on this to show that this is effective? Is there a main piece of research that you refer them to or offer? Um, there was a paper. I, I did it, and then I did an update to it uh, called What is Neurofeedback? An update, where I reviewed a lot of that literature. It's about eight years old now. Uh, I routinely give out a copy of that uh, to uh, my patients at the end of the intake history um, because it summarizes the research in the field. I emphasize that there's been some fine research that occurred since that time, but that that will give them a, a fairly good overview of, of uh, what neurofeedback is, the different ways of doing it, uh, as well as some of the outcomes. Ari, right, right. You might, want to, you might want to ask Ron for a copy of his book. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Not, I, mean, I have that paper that uh, Corey just mentioned. I'm putting it out on the listserv. Oh, great. Thank you, Rob. You bet. Um, Corey, any, what's the current status on past life regression sort of stuff? I haven't seen it on 60 Minutes recently. I'm not sure if I understand the question. Uh, the guidelines for using age regression? Well, past life issues, that oh. sort of stuff that's kind of yeah. far out. I, I believe past life um, regressions are nothing but suggestion effects. And there's some pretty good research to show that. Um, I, you know, it might still be therapeutically effective if somebody really believes in that. Personally, I'm simply not willing to to do it. But um, if, if the person comes in really believing that and the therapist uses it, I mean, I'd be worried about ethical um, kinds of things if you were ever brought in front of your licensure board with that. Um, so I, I won't do it. But if the patient believed in it, it can be be effective. In terms of guidelines for using age regression, I chaired a national uh, panel. I think there were nine of us. I was the lead author, published a little book called um, let's see here, Clinical Hypnosis and Memory. Uh, that and our, our book on memory trauma treatment and law is actually used in Quantico, Virginia for the, um, the work that uh, FBI folks are, are taught to do with, with memory and memory enhancement. In fact, they, they called me up. Uh, uh, our local police here locally had called on the Elizabeth Smart case and said, would you uh, recommend something? They said, well, the guy that uh, was the lead author on, on the book here uh, that we use is in Salt Lake. And so we, we used that in that case. Other questions? Um, First of all, thank you very much for this uh, fantastic presentation. Just a quick confirmation. Preparing clients with hip hypnotic um, or pre-hypnotic um, methods is probably increasing sleep efficiency training by 80 to 90 percent. That's mm -hmm. my personal experience in the field of sleep improvement. Yes, that's why I say if it's not a, a real chronic sleep problem, um, I will often start by just getting the patient using some self-hypnosis. I actually have a, a CD that uh, I'd studio recorded where the suggestions are getting fewer and fewer, uh, longer and longer pauses. My voice was digitally reduced to go down to about one half volume eventually just saying a phrase and then a single word and then just silence that they can listen to, to to fall asleep to. A simple hypnotic approach will get a lot of insomnia um, out of the way. But you know, if it's very chronic insomnia involved with other problems like depression, anxiety, then you know I'll, I'll go ahead with neurofeedback. Yeah, yeah, I use both. 
uh -huh. more space. Yeah. But uh, the yeah, most uh, the most beneficial effect I see or I observe if I prepare the client to neurofeedback, and of course the uh, the visualization has to be targeted, so well, kind I, of feel safe <clears throat> and stuff like that. I I believe the two most powerful therapeutic tools for influencing mind body kinds of things are neurofeedback and clinical hypnosis, and when you have skills in both, you can really cover the waterfront. That's maybe my concluding remark here. <laughs> All right, well, Corey, thank you so much. Appreciate your taking the time to um, present for us today at a great, great turnout. And um, if people have questions, if you will email them to me, I will email those questions to Corey and he'll respond back so it saves him having to read, uh, you know, a lot of emails. I've just put out a copy of his uh, his um, PowerPoint in a PDF format and the paper, What is Neurofeedback Update? Um, I've sent that out already, so you should have those on their way. Corey, thank you so much. Have a great You're weekend. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.